Welcome back to Fire Emblem The Sacred Stones. Last time we finished up Ephraim's route with this chapter, Father and Son, and learned that there's something darker at the heart of this war. But now we're going to be jumping back to Erica's route. Chapter 15 exists on both, but I find the special boss conversations in Erica's version much more satisfying. So we're going to be doing that on her route. Also, note the sheer difference in playtime between the two here. Pretty much exactly two hours. I chalk this up to either Ephraim's route having less long route chapters, or just the fact that I had to have all of my grinding sessions on camera on Erica's, so I had to have animations turned on then. Anyway though, we're going back to Erica's. And this one takes place directly after Erica's chapter 14, with no opportunity to go back to the world map. Ephraim, weirdly enough, despite the fact that they imply a heavy sense of urgency, also I like how all of the royals are in that scene there, briefly, but yes, despite the fact they imply a heavy sense of urgency to rescue Erica, you can still play around with the Tower of Valny or the world map all you want before going to chapter 15. For Erica though, there's no break between the two chapters. And also, this dialogue here gives a pretty good recap of what's been going on in Erica's route. It almost feels like it was designed so that you'd be playing through Ephraim's route before this and then coming back to Erica. So yes, they're still completely surrounded. And Ralston's knights are defeated, and... We're about to get a gameplay tutorial disguised as story dialogue. So, Sand. Sand is annoying. We'll be dealing with a lot of it this chapter. It's rough, coarse, it gets everywhere, and mounted units get severely slowed down. Thankfully, magic users and obviously flying units are unimpeded by it, as Seth explains here. Uh, unfortunately, you're a lot weaker than he is, so this is going to be a problem. Thankfully, her brother is on the way. Now we get an Erica exclusive scene here. Kind of interesting. On Erica's route, the scene before this chapter focuses on Volta, which I guess kind of makes sense. On Ephraim's, you get a scene that focuses more on Leon and Kalark. Yeah, he's pretty much a one-man army. Oh, great, we're gonna have three bosses in this chapter. Or not. And when Volta of all people calls you disgusting, you know you have problems. And yet more of this. Please, please, please shut up. Thankfully, he's gonna die soon. And now Reeve is about to sum up Volta's character, basically. Who is their master? Uh, not likely. So, with that, we launch straight into the chapter. I guess I can show the map now. So, the mini-map display here looks really ugly, but anyway, we've got a lot of sand here. A lot of deserts. Desert, as Seth mentioned, severely slows down most types of units, especially mounted ones. However, magic users can move through the sand without penalty. The series has always flip-flopped between the reasons for that, whether it's because they command spirits to just part the sands in front of them, or just because they wear lighter clothing. But anyway, the desert severely slows everyone who isn't a major or flyer. Especially mounted units, as Seth mentioned. So that means these things here are going to have uh, a lot less of a movement range. If we check the map though, we've got on one side some axe users, myrmidons, mercenaries, couple of mages, and Kalark the Tiger Eye, who has pretty solid stats all around with pretty decent strength in particular. 
He's an axe using hero, and he has an S rank in axes. Be aware of that, though, because that means that he's going to have plus 5 hit and critical, and, well, why he's got an axe equipped, and that's all of his attacks. Also, the Tomahawk... Oh, doesn't have a crit rate in this game. <laughs> doesn't Radiant Dawn. He also has the Hoplon Guard, which makes it so that anyone attacking him has no chance of a critical. Given who we want to fight him with, that's a bad thing. However... The Hoplon Guard happens to be a basic item, which means as long as we have a Thief with a speed stat above 13... Yes, that's going to be pretty fun. On this side of the map, we have lots of Wyvern Riders, obviously. Be aware that they uh, are going to be able to ignore the Desert Penalties. We have a couple of Berserkers as well. This guy in particular... He's pretty much put here just to troll people who want to get revenge on Volta, because Volta's down there, and obviously most players would send Cormac around here, but this guy's like, ah, Dragon Axe. Yeah, that's uh, pretty bad. Although if you can force him to use the Hand Axe, you can actually get that Dragon Axe for yourself. He's pretty scary, though, in general. He's got a very high crit rate due to being a Berserker, and I've had him double Ross before. Not even with a hand axe, with his actual dragon axe. That's pretty terrifying. Also, speaking of terrifying, this guy down here has a devil axe. Very, very powerful. Very heavy. Gives a lot of weapon experience, which is completely irrelevant to enemies, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. And has a luck... I believe it's 31 minus luck percent chance of damaging yourself instead of the enemy. So this guy has terrible luck, so he could very easily kill himself with that. But it hits so hard, you probably want to attack him at range anyway. Don't want to risk getting hit by that. Also, this guy and this guy. They're also here to troll Cormag if you're trying to get revenge on Volta. Also, this guy right here, he's got the, egl uh, the, eclipse, the Eclipse Spell and a stealable Guiding Ring. But uh, anyway, the Eclipse Spell. This halves enemy HP. It's the closest thing that Dark has to an equivalent of Bolting. However, its hit rate is abysmal. That's a base hit rate of 30 in a game with true hits. That is... It's, I don't want to say it's no threat, because if I say that, it's probably going to get me. It's just not going to hit you very often. Also, this paladin is a little bit scary. What the heck is up with these troubadour stats? Wow, these, these troubadours are awful. Forgot how bad they were, but anyway. This one is a sleep staff, so stay out of its range, obviously. And of course, the one we've all been waiting for, it's Volta. Finally, we actually get to fight him. And his stats are pretty impressive. He's also a Wyvern Knight, and has an S rank in Lancers. So, again, plus 5 to accuracy and critical whenever he has a Lance equipped, which is always. He has a Spear, a Killer Lance, which is pretty terrifying. The Philly Shield, which means that he's not weak to arrows. Once again, like Kalark, you can kind of cheese this with a thief, but anyway. And also remember that being a Wyvern Knight, he has the Pierce skill, which is level percent, so in this case, 13%. So you're going to be ready for him to do a fixed 32 damage to you. That's pretty terrifying. So interesting, his affinity is ice, not uh, dark or anything like that. But anyway, with that... Let's pick our characters. So, obviously we want Cormac here, and obviously we want Joshua here. And I've got a few people that I want to promote. Here's the thing, though. I'm not going to bring LaRachel here. There's a reason for this. So, magic users can ignore the desert. However, mounted units get slowed down by it. Severely. Unfortunately, the mounted part trumps the magic part, so she gets severely slowed down by the desert. So, if I'm going to kick out someone, it's probably going to be her. Renek, though, I'm going to bring. You want at least one thief here, although if you're going for all the items in this chapter, having two thieves might not be a bad idea either. At the moment, though, I think I... Yeah, I can't really afford to drop anyone else. Now, we haven't seen these characters for a while, so let's quickly check our stats. Uh, Erica's not as good as Ephraim on this route. Cormag is looking pretty strong. And he's got enough speed that Volta won't double him, which is very good. Loot is, well, she's doing better in the speed department than on Ephraim's route, but still worse than she should be. Ewan is kind of similar. More speed and less magic than on Ephraim's route. Amelia's strength got terribly screwed here. 
Tana's strength got very blessed here. Either that or I got very, very screwed with Tana over on Ephraim's root. This is generally how Tana ends up for me, although that defense is pretty weak. Ross here, that speed is horrendous. Joshua is uh, pretty much fine. Garrick is more than fine. Natasha's a lot lower level here than I thought she'd be, but she's going to get a lot of levels in this chapter. And Renek, whose stats don't really matter. So, obviously, I want to go ahead and give Cormac the Dragon Spear. Don't really need a hammering just yet, or that energy ring. Want to keep his inventory as free as possible so I can steal things. The Sword Reaver, I guess I can give that to Ross. I don't need the hammer at all, because there aren't any... I don't think there are any armored enemies in this map, so yeah, don't need that. And I'm going to go ahead and... Who has the... I know somebody has the Ocean Seal. It's you. Because I might need to use that in this chapter. Now, Tana, she's going to go ahead and grab that Killer Lance that I bought earlier. And she's also going to take... Even though I don't think she'll actually get there, I'm going to go ahead and grab that Elysian Whip. Ewan, he's going to uh, deposit that sword. He's going to go ahead and take a Guiding Ring just in case he gets to level 20. And other than that, he's fine. Amelia, she's not going to be contributing very much with her terrible strength stats, so is there any, like, Silver Lances that I've got that she could use? Th three use Silver Lance, might as well. Now, as for Cormag, I'm going to go ahead and let him have a sword, because against all those Berserkers, having a sword might be useful, and starting with a D means he doesn't have to be stuck with Iron Ones. Now, Garrick, you're going to take that... The Zombatote might not be a bad idea to bring here. I'm going to go ahead and take that Silver Blade, though. And Natasha, she's going to go ahead and grab one of those Physic Starves. In fact, let's go ahead and take both Physic Starves, just in case. And you are going to... you don't need that Heavy Spear. You're going to take a Guiding Ring again, just in case you reach level 20. I suppose Amelia could take a Knight's Crest. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, convoy that Guiding Ring. Trade the Shamshir over to Joshua. Actually, speaking of Joshua, you don't need the Armor Slayer. Can't use Adhulma yet, but I like keeping that in his inventory just in case. And I'm going to convoy that and swap it for the Shamshir. Because I want as much crit on Joshua as possible. And with that, I think we're okay. Do I have any more Dark Tomes? No, nothing. And, well, Luke wouldn't be able to use Excalibur anyway. Okay, I think that should be all. So, let's go ahead and set our formation. Obviously, Joshua wants to go as close to Kalark as possible. And I'm going to send Garrick around that direction as well. Amelia here isn't bad either. You're going to go around there. Renek is going to go closer to this side of the map you'll be as central as possible, so you can physic anybody who needs it. Ross there, loot around there. I might actually need her to take on the Berserker, but uh, anyway. What I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to very quickly have Ross use a speed wing. The stat boosters that I've hoarded are not going to be useful here because I'm not going to be carrying this file forward regardless, and I really, really want this, so I'm going to speed wing Ross. And now you take back that Ocean Seal. Uh, wherever it is. It's right at the bottom. It's not even grouped in with the other promotion items. So, one thing that I want to go over before we start. The reason why I mentioned that you want a thief here. There is hidden treasure on this map. In various areas of this map, there are some, like, little blocks of area. Like, for example, this here has an item in it that have buried treasure. So, you need to move somebody to one of those spaces to get a chance of picking up that treasure. Thieves have a 100% chance of picking it up. Everyone else, it's their luck stat minus, well, plus one. So, Josh would have a 10% chance of finding treasure, whereas Tana would have a 19% chance. But you want to use thieves for the guaranteed rate of finding it. Now, I'm going to bring up a map right now of where all the treasure is. You want to make sure you find most of this, because a lot of these items are very valuable, and you can't get them anywhere else. So, yes, we're going to make sure that we do that. With that out of the way, it's going to be time to save and get ready to fight. Time to get some sweet revenge times two. 
And yes, this is a route chapter, so we have to kill everything on this map, of which there, there are a lot. Something to note here, though, is this gate is actually the same kind of gate that bosses have been using all game. So if you want a turtle here, you actually can put someone on there. It's not really all that necessary, though, I find. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to watch out for this guy right here. Gotta be very careful, because if Ross is equipping a hand axe, he actually does get doubled. So, let's see. I don't think he actually dies to it, though. But I do want to force him to use the hand axe. Also, those mercenaries both have blades, so they're way down quite a bit in the attack speed department. Though still not enough for Tana to double with that. Uh, let's go for the uh, Killer Lance. I would have appreciated the dodge there, and I would have appreciated the crit on the first hit, but still. Right, this guy, though. How much critical do you have using the... It's like a 23 crit rate. The problem with using Cormac here is Cormac's luck is pretty bad. Ross gets doubled, though. I mean, if he's equipping a hand axe. Okay, I guess I'm gonna try... Oh, this is a bit of a waste of the spear, though. Definitely a waste of his spear. Suppose I can go for the Sword Reaver here first. And so I only end up using one use of the spear. And just hopefully he doesn't get criticals. Don't know if you've actually seen Cormac fight as a Wyvern Lord before. The animations look a bit better with actual melee weapons. So, okay, right. Next, I'm gonna have to... Just gotta watch out for the movement range of these guys. Having Ewan go around here provokes some of the Wyvern Riders, but not all of them. And none of them can actually get to him directly this turn, which is good. Annoying thing about the desert is that everyone here gets 5% evasion. It's not quite as bad as the tiles in Echoes, but still pretty annoying. One thing about mages is they really have control of this battlefield. See, this guy barely has much of a movement range. They can really choose wherever they want to go and not be in much danger of getting attacked by enemies. So, mages are pretty awesome to have around here. Just be aware of the tiles that are sand, but not actually desert, because they count as normal movement tiles. So, enemies will be able to reach uh, people on there for the most part. Now, I like to have Loot stay around here for the time being, just in case I need her to fight that Berserker. Now, next, I'm going to... I suppose I can have Garrett go. Let me just check something. Alright, that is in range of that bandit. The village down there is pretty much in no danger, because this bandit prioritizes attacking you over attacking the village, so... Yeah, like I said, the village is in no real danger. Garrett only needs a tiny bit more experience to get to level 20, though, so for now... Actually, I might as well use Joshua a little bit here. Of course, saving my better weapons. But, for now... All we really need is a Steel Sword. And having a crit rate of 20 without any killer weapon to speak of is pretty awesome. Ah, uh, now Amelia. The problem is, armored units get really badly slowed down by the desert, and they already move slowly to begin with, so... That's definitely not good. I'm keeping back because I want Garrick to fight the majority of these enemies. And anybody... Alright, Tana needs healing. Obviously, make sure you're not in range of that Berserker, because that would be really stupid. And here is the Psychic stuff, I mean Physic stuff. <laughs> I used to call it Psychic when I was younger. Just kind of rearranging a few of the letters. I always used to think that sounded cool, though. Well, at least you're well on your way to maxing out resistance. There are going to be quite a few reinforcements in this chapter, by the way, so be aware of that. Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm going to have Erica just go back here. 
I like to keep Teddies around the middle because sometimes I need to refresh people around this side. Now, most of the enemies here aren't going to move unless they're directly provoked, but, um... Hi there! Yeah, like I said, the village, you don't need to worry about it at all, because this guy just... ...charges right at you instead of going for the village. And, of course, Axe users versus a Swordmaster, obviously not going to do much. Finally, I actually get to use a Swordmaster. I really love Swordmasters, they're one of my favourite classes. Well, most of the time. You went for Joshua, huh? I guess you do a bit more damage. And that's why they're one of my favourite classes. I just love... just The combination of the evasion and the high crit rate is just awesome. Of course, in Fates, they're pretty badly nerfed unless they're named Ryoma. Uh, Hana getting one-shotted by everything was always frustrating. Yeah, just the way that that, that game doesn't have true hit meant that... Swordmaster just couldn't dodge like they used to. And in, well, Shadow Dragon, they weren't that great either. Getting, like, a bonus to hit instead of critical for some very weird reason. I thought that was going to miss for a second. It's kind of funny, because they made Swordmasters a lot better in New Mystery of the Emblem, but not because, well... Okay, that was not a critical, that was good. That was not doubling, that was actually also good, because I might want someone else to finish you off. So yeah, the class itself didn't really change in New Mystery of the Emblem, but, well, apart from the fact that it did get a bonus to evade rather than hit, but what happened was that enemies on the higher difficulty levels got a lot faster, and so having higher speed meant a lot more. It's kind of interesting that way. I remember Shadow Dragon being a game where, well, at least for me, generals were actually quite decent, because... Speed wasn't all that important, and raw defense helped more because of the way that they nerfed the evasion formulas. So, I liked using generals a lot in that game. Okay, now let's see. Gotta be careful about luring the mages, but... Yes, Joshua can go straight into the desert. 17, 18, 7. So, they do like... 10 and 11. How much chance do these guys have of hitting nothing? Well, one of them has nothing. Or I could use the Killing Edge for maximum evasion. Now, yeah, let's just go for this one first, because he's actually got a chance of hitting. Ah, 53 crit rate. It's still not as amazing as Rutger in, FE, uh, in FE6, who, as much as I'm not a fan of that game, Rutger is still amazing because of the ridiculous... I think it's like 30% critical bonus that Swordmasters have in that game, and also Berserkers. Which is just really fun, because you can reach crit rates of over 100% in that one. Plus Rutger's insane hard mode bonuses. Yeah, Rutger in general is pretty hilarious. I don't think Renek is in danger there. Don't worry, Kalark doesn't move. Now, that guy. That guy needs to die. Ah, oh, that's one off. I could use that. Could use that. 5% more hit rate, but there's also the risk of getting brutally killed if I miss it. Okay, well, I guess first things first, I'm gonna. So you can't even reach this turn either, so that's why mages. why I said mages kind of ruled this battlefield. So my plan is next turn to put you in on that forward, but for now, of course, in a practice of this, I missed with this 86%. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah, Cormac can get to you and kill you pretty quickly. Can Ross finish off... Hey, he actually does? Not quite one shot. And I don't like the idea of Ross getting... Uh, that's a 60 hit rate. Okay, I think I'm gonna go for... The problem is that you could potentially get 9% critical if I miss the 80. Uh, if only you had 1 HP less. Uh, going for Thunder. Hey, I guess Lightning did strike. And that puts you at level 19, I think? 
Also, I think Lou's getting a bit magic screwed on Ephraim's route, which is also annoying. And with that, we manipulate him into dropping his Dragon Axe, which is actually very good, because Ross could use that to completely destroy his wife and riders. If it weren't for the fact that I don't want to do that, because I obviously want Cormac to do this, because he needs to. They actually give you quite a few Dragon Slaying weapons in this weapon. In this weapon chapter, I mean. <laughs> because there's a hidden treasure... Uh... That's, by the way, what the Dragon Spear does, but I don't even need to use that here. I could have actually just had Cormac use the sword in that Berserker, but I wanted to use him down here. But yeah, there is a hidden Worm Slayer. I guess you've already got a taste of the Wyvern lore animations with the scripted fight between Glenn and Volta before, but yeah, the fact that they just sort of fly all over the screen is pretty cool. Do have to watch out for the Sleep Staff, though, because she will move if you get uh, into her range. Now I'm going to keep Ross around here, because very soon there are going to be some Pegasus Knight reinforcements coming from the top of the map, which is also what I want Tana for. Okay, heal you. Who else needs healing? Uh, I guess it wouldn't hurt to heal Joshua. Now very soon, things are going to get a little bit more intri- You're not even anywhere close to Joshua's in range of Joshua, that's unfortunate, and I kind of want to keep you around here, because I want to heal people around the middle, because those Pegasus Knight reinforcements actually two-shot Tana, so that's not good. For some reason, these three arrive at the end of your player phase, rather than the end of the enemy phase, so you don't get a chance to control them for this turn, but Ephraim has arrived, and he's brought Decel and Noel with him. Which are his, I guess, kind of root exclusive characters. There aren't any true root exclusive characters, because you get them all anyway, but... So, this is what happens with Decel and Noel on this route. They join now. The equivalent on Ephraim's route, you'll see. I'll show that in extra footage. And yes, if you're on uh, Erica's route, you probably have no idea who this guy is. So, he kind of gives a recap that he's known Prince Leon. Uh, yeah, except I didn't deploy them. That's, yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Anyway, though. Like I said, kind of weird they join at the end of the player phase rather than the end of the enemy phase. <laughs> Once again, sword masters are awesome. They got even better when they... Well, actually, they had access to Astro and AP4, so... That was a true hit of probably around 95% or something? Ugh. Yeah, I think it's got a bit old, me complaining about my luck in this playthrough, but it looks like it's never going to end. Well, at least they both miss 53s. That's something. It's kind of funny how the Wyvern just almost curls entirely up into a ball while it's flying. Oh right, you, yeah. So, being a magic user, you have a lot more movement than you probably expect, but you also use Luna, so you're not a threat at all. Okay, I'm probably going to need either need to heal Joshua or quickly take out these mages. Oh. Wouldn't be funny if he ran directly into Joshua and attacked in melee range, but uh, they're not that dumb. And Javelin. And that also missed, so he dodged everything this turn. And yeah, from here we get some Pegasus Knight reinforcements. Which thankfully we're in hand axe roll. And these are the bog standard terrible speed Pegasus Knights that Ross can double with a hand axe which is pretty sad. They do hit kind of hard with their Steel Lancers, though. Like, just as a preview of how much damage they do to Tana. They do half of her health. Like I said, they two-shot her. So I'm going to have Tana attack from range. Starts off pretty small, but there are going to be even more Pegasus reinforcements from a bit more of an inconvenient area coming quite soon. Okay, you're level 20. Watch out for that guy. Also, you want to keep an eye on the turn... Okay, it's only turn 3. On turn 7, something pretty annoying happens. 
So let's just say you might want some powerful characters from your starting position down near Ephraim's starting position at around turn 7. Neither of those was a crit, but, uh, oh well, at least that's one low-use weapon not cluttering my convoy. Also, we get Luna. Yay! 50 hit rate weapon. That's amazing, right? Yeah. With the aid of Teddies, I wonder if Luke could actually get one of those Wyvern Riders. Let's see. Alright, I also need to make sure that I do something. I also need to make sure that I go into options on status and switch on Ephraim, Decel, and Knoll's animations. Well, Luke's doubling something, that's a good sign. Oh, okay, that was lucky. So, that's the hidden treasure for this area of the map. I wasn't even trying to go for that. I might need... Yeah, let's dump Elfire. It's gonna weigh you down hideously. 15% chance of getting that. That was... Oh, that was alright. Anyway, so with that we get Metis' Tome. This description is very vague. What this does is it's the same effect as Aether's drops from FE7. It increases all of a character's growth rates by 5% each. So, obviously use that on someone who still has a lot of levels to gain, but it could be... I guess it can kind of add up in the long run. Uh, it's got 30 uses, might as well. Just don't want to run the risk of missing with a few of those and having that guy attack loot. But, yeah, there's a village that mentions that item, so I was expecting to have to talk about it there. Now, like I said, what I want to do here is put Ewan on this fort, and then he can fight these guys pretty effectively. The mercenary still might be a problem, but these fighters are going to have virtually no chance of hitting him while he's on this fort. Just looking at the map for a second, I find it kind of interesting that a couple of the houses near the enemy starting position are already destroyed. Wonder if Volta went on a rampage at some point. Also, the bones here. The bones are something of a clue as to where the treasures are, but that's not always a reliable method of determining where they are. I don't want Joshua to attack Kalark before uh, we're ready, so I obviously don't want... Uh... That's just out of range. Well then. Gonna have to do this then. Guess if you gain one more magic from the last level up, you might have been able to make this without Joshua needing to move. But it still fully healed him. Physic heals the same amount as regular heal, I believe. It's just, well, long-ranged. And now... I'm gonna need Renek here for... 18... 17... 3! Well, that's actually really terrible. I should have rescued Erica with Amelia before. I now need to have either Renek or... I guess Garrick has enough HP to solve it. The mages are not going to double him. Because 15 halved is like 7 and they only have 9 speed, so they're not going to double him. I didn't want to have to do this. I wanted to promote Garrick this turn, actually, but I'm going to have to do that. Unfortunately. Also, we've got Ephraim, Nolan, to sell down here. Like I was mentioning before, well, a few chapters ago, whichever Lord you didn't pick is going to join six levels higher than they were when they last left, up to a maximum of level 15. They get automatically leveled up uh, in the same way as normal levels, so their stats might vary here. They also have the exact same inventory they had before they left. Decel here is, uh, this is the first time we're seeing him in Erica's route. Decel on Erica's route joins a lot later than he does on Ephraim's. He does get two auto levels to compensate, joining at level 10 instead of level 8. And he's still pretty strong for this point in the game, but he is a lot more useful on Ephraim's route simply for being available much longer there. And we also have Noel. 
The only real difference between Nolo and Erica's route, as compared to Ephraim's, is that on Ephraim's, you have a chance to grind him before entering Chapter 15. On Erica's, you get him in Chapter 15. So if you do want to grind him, I guess he is technically better on Ephraim's route, but really, I find him pretty much the same on both. So with that, I like to send Noel up here to rescue this village, because I'm not putting him on the front line at all with zero luck and two defense. Gotta be careful of the enemies here, because there's that guy who's kind of difficult. But I think I can afford- oh, Ephraim can't even go on the fort anyway. Don't even need to. I'm kind of cheating here because I know this file's not going to continue very much further forward, so I don't really care about Ephraim's weapon uses. Normally I would worry a lot more about them and be much more conservative with the Regan Leif, but here I'm going to go crazy. Also this village. So on Ephraim's route you won't know that, but we're on Erica's route, so obviously we know of her fate. And so we get a Master Seal. This works the same way it does in other Fire Emblem games, it appears. It's a universal promotion item that... I'll show you its description, which is kind of interesting, but uh, it promotes most characters if they're level 10 or above. So, later on, they just replace the concept of unique class-based promotion items with just Master Seals in general, and have everyone promote with Master Seals. Sacred Stones was actually the first game that Master Seals appeared in, well, at least the first where they were actually called Master Seals, and the first where they were actually used. Master Seals did appear in the coding of FE5, but they were unused. They are actually perfectly functional if you hack them into the game, though. FE7 had Earth Seals, which did the same thing, but weren't called Master Seals, so I don't consider them the same item. So anyway, Sacred Stones was the first Fire Emblem game to actually have Master Seals that were both used in the game and actually called Master Seals, if that makes sense. The kind of interesting that they were planned to be in FE5, but scraps. Okay, here's Eclipse. And apologies if there was a ding sound there. Yeah, that's my phone. Eclipse is pretty much no threat. In FE6, Eclipse reduced your HP to 1 instead of half, but it was even more inaccurate than it was in this game, as if that was possible. So, yeah. It's nowhere near the ridiculously uh, painful death of the Hell spell in FE4. That's Hell with one L after the Norse Goddess. But... Uh, yeah, that thing actually had a hit rate and reduced your HP to 1, and instantly killed you if you had 1 HP, so that was pretty bad. Okay, Physic is fine, it's the other Troubadour I'm worried about. And we get a couple of Pegasus Knight reinforcements from just above Jahana Hall. Although the side of the hall is Pegasus proof, just like a lot of the walls in Erica's Chapter 10. But these Pegasus Knights are pretty annoying if you have some frail characters towards the rear. But for now, we'll just squash a few of them. Gotta make sure that two of them can't attack Tana, because I'm very, very far away with my Physics Staff user at this point. And I wanted to promote Garrick. And I also want to kill off these mages. Don't like that crit rate, though. Might as well go for this, then. Okay, I was worried that you'd hit there, and that would make you a very lucky mage. Still don't know what I'm going to do about Erica. Suppose I can finish this thing off. I could have Garrick pass Erica over to Amelia. Actually, I need to heal Winnick and Joshua too. Okay, let's uh, give to you, and now we can use the Hero's Crest. 
They can go for either Hero or Ranger, but I obviously want to go for Hero. Ranger would severely destroy his movement in this chapter, so, uh, yeah. I pretty much always make Garrick a Hero, just because his con is perfect for using axes. Theoretically, he's great as a Ranger too, but I just, it's one of the few classes I've never even tried in this game. That's pretty powerful, especially that 15 con. And we can now use axes, which I guess we can get out of the convoy if we need them. Pretty powerful. There's a reason why I'm healing Renek here, by the way. Because Kalark actually has a decent amount of damage on him and also a pretty decent crit rate against him. Seven, yeah. I also want these Pegasus Knights gone. My plan here is to have Renek swipe that thing, but I'll wait a little bit before I do that. Oh, okay. Uh, this is a problem, because I might lure in the Sleep Staff Troubadour if I do that. And I don't want Ephraim to fall asleep right in front of that Paladin, or a bunch of reinforcements. But I also want this thing to die. That's a hit, that's good. That's in range of that Paladin, which has a Silver Lance. Okay. I believe in Ephraim. I believe he'll be able to do this. Having no healers down in this part of the map is uh, also kind of uh, something that makes this a bit tricky. Conveniently, your movement goes just out of that guy's range. Uh, I guess I'll go for you, because you're kind of more of a threat. Please hit. Thank you. Good. Oh yeah, it's not quite level 19, it's just level 18. Loot might do decently against these Pegasus Knights now I think about it. I could use a uh, Metis' Tome to give her a marginally better chance of actually gaining speed. So, interesting thing down here is that a lot of the enemies here won't move until... In fact, some of us not even if you go directly into their range. Like, these Wyvern Riders don't really move until you provoke the other enemies in the area. They really want you to to provoke that guy into moving. I want to lure this guy away first for obvious reasons. Is Teddy's? Yes, she's in range. And of course, being around longer, Teddy's has a lot more levels on this route than she does on Ephraim's. Uh, not quite there yet. Can you still attack Teddy's? No. Which is good. You've got to make sure that only one of the Pegasus Knights can attack loot, otherwise it's going to end in disaster. And I don't think you can go for Natasha. <sighs> that hit could be bad. And somehow Ephraim left him with 1 HP, well, probably thanks to the Fort Defense bonus. Okay, getting 1 point of defense there is good. I would have liked strength, but 1 point of defense is good. This guy is kind of... That's a higher hit rate than I expected, but he's still probably going down. This also means that Ewan will be able to reinforce Ephraim pretty quickly, because he can cross that desert fast. To magic users, this map isn't all that big. I guess those are some decent stats. His skill is still pretty low on this route. Okay, that's what I thought would happen. Nice dodge there. Pretty sure loot's gonna double you. Yeah, that's fine. As long as loot's not getting doubled in return, it's gonna be pretty much smooth sailing here. But this isn't smooth sailing. I need to heal Joshua now. Because I want him to be fully ready for his fight with Kalark, obviously. I also don't want any flute criticals in that fight. So we'll see what happens. First, though. Ephraim, dodge please. And nice being just one damage over its HP. There are going to be a lot of Cavalier reinforcements. Thank you for dodging that. 
and overkill. That's part of why I like in the D 3DS games, you can actually see the damage numbers of attacks that you do. So you can actually see when an attack does like over 100 damage or something. I'm still nervous though. And you're still going for Eclipse, which is pretty much completely ineffectual. Javelin. Please don't let that be exactly enough for the Paladin to kill Ephraim, because if that is the... Oh, the Paladin's not even moving anyway. Yeah, remember what I said about some of these enemies not wanting to move? Okay, I've got to keep an eye on the turns, though. Status, not options this time. Five. Okay, I'm well off the thing happening. Uh, don't know if I should move to cell forward or whether I should... Because I kind of want Ephraim to... I think Ephraim actually has to use the elixir now. Glad he still has that in his inventory because otherwise this would be kind of tricky. Thanks to... I mean, Dussel is pretty strong, but you have no healers on his part of the map. And Noel is kind of not that good. Okay, if Joshua goes there, uh, but Rennick has to go there, because otherwise... Um, I don't want Rennick getting hit by both Kalark and... Uh, and a Pegasus Knight. Go here, Joshua. Yeah, Joshua will still be in support range of Natasha, but if I go there, she'll be out of range of the Pegasus Knight, so might as well Physic Joshua from here. Laziest use of Physic ever. It's kind of the equivalent of using a mobile phone to call someone who's right next to you. I love how if you try and do that in Pokemon Gold and Silver, the game just says, just talk to them, which is pretty funny. But anyway, now it's time. So, I'm actually going to be getting two items here, because there's also a treasure in this part of the map, so... Goodbye critical projection! I'm pretty sure nearly everyone who plays Sacred Stones has done this at least once. And we get a Warp Staff from the treasure here. If you play other Fire Emblem games, you'll know how powerful this is, but it is A-ranked in this game, which I actually agree with. I don't know why it was such a low rank in Shadow Dragon. Anyway, though, without the Hoplon Guard... Kalark is suddenly very, very vulnerable to criticals, especially if you also have a support boosting Joshua. So, it's not actually that much of a crit boost. Let's begin. Oh, besides you murdering his mother, fine! So these two know each other from before. And he managed to figure out his true heritage, which uh, is definitely more than anyone in this army found out. I mean, considering that Kalark is actually from Jahana, though, it makes more sense that he'd be able to figure that out. I love this conversation so much. Oh, really? We'll see about that. Um, okay. That was actually really bad. 
Hit him with a 34. Please don't let my luck totally curse Joshua to death here, because that would be awful. Like, my mood has gone from just being on an awesomeness high from that conversation to suddenly being very, very worried. Oh, please don't let me down, luck. Speaking of luck letting you down, yeah. That's just a re regular enemy without a killer weapon at all, and it has a 7 crit rate against Noel. Yeah, Noel is kind of ridiculously unlucky. Oh, hey, you and actually doubles this guy. Well, he has a blade, but still. But I'm actually pretty terrified about the prospect of Joshua getting hit again. Not to mention there are also those Pegasus Knights to worry about, who definitely are in range of Joshua. Of course, this guy's in range of... dying. Ross is almost there. Uh, still nine uses of the short spear, that's fine. <sighs> Had a feeling that would happen sooner or later. However... I have an insurance policy. And I also have teddies, so yeah, this is precisely why I have teddies around here. Oh! Wow, loot's been a complete fiend when it comes to finding treasure here. I guess it makes sense because loot, you know, loves ancient lore and things like that. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if the game actually programmed it in so that loot worked like a thief for the purposes of finding treasure. I don't think that's true, but it didn't make sense. Anyway, though, this is another one of the items that you really, 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 really want to find in this chapter. The silver card. While you have this in, this, in your inventory, you can buy anything in shops for half price. This is amazing. So, you obviously want that, especially if you're going for post-game, because it makes stat boosters a lot cheaper. It and the members card are a good set of items to combine. Now, I still don't want to move Cormag down there, because you're in the way. And turn... I press options instead of status again. Still turn 5. Oh, please, 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 please don't be bad. Well, that was bad, but loot's not going to die here. And I think these are the last Pegasus reinforcements. There are going to be more reinforcements from up the top part of the map, but they're not going to be Pegasus Knights. Of course, you're going to go for Joshua first. Well, you dodged that. But can you dodge the 30? And, well, you can use it Holmer now. In fact, that'd be really great revenge against Kalark. We'll see if you get the chance to do that or not. Dussel is, like I said, pretty strong at this point. He's more than capable of protecting Ephraim. But he might need a little bit of help on around turn 7. Yeah, that guy's just going to sit there and run his uh, turn of uses. Oh god. Okay, that's a much higher hit rate, I just realized. Also, he's saying his regular boss quote here, which I also really like, but I'm really terrified. Okay, good. Not quite enough, but I'm sure we'll be able to finish him off next turn. And Joshua's not even gonna need any help here, which is great. Ah, the javelins. Always leaving more enemies for me to have to clean up on the player phase. And more cavalier reinforcements. So, like I said, we can actually use this now. That's exactly one damage. Given how my luck has been so far, I'm not going to risk that. I'm just going to go for this straight away. But this is going to be a fitting way for Joshua to finish this fight. 
But you know what? Let's leave that until the last thing I do this turn. Now, there's a little strip around here that has another hidden item. Silent Staff! The one that I mocked for being useless that ended up coming back to bite me. Uh, now those bones are blocking the way. Probably gonna have to have Garrick fight this guy. Just gonna use the Zambato for reasons. Which might actually come in handy later. I love the hero critical so much. It's just like the mercenary critical, but even more awesome. And even more ridiculous. The whole shield toss thing is... yeah. It's, it's one of the sillier critical animations in the GBA games, but I still really love it. Now, Noel is going to run away because he doesn't want to be here on turn 7. When I practiced this, I had to have Dussel rescue him, which, if anything, was actually a good thing because it meant that Dussel could uh, avoid getting... Uh, avoid stealing all the experience by doubling everything. So yeah, this sand is normal movement. 20. Three defend. Uh, I don't think I want to do that. I'm going to want Ewan to come down here to try and support Ephraim and his crew, but don't want to go too far. And once again, continuing to spam this because because I'm not really going to be continuing further with this route. Well, I mean, I, I actually am, but it's all going to be off camera. Also, just sell something with two silver weapons on this route, which is pretty cool. And no more Pegasus Knights from up here, but like I said, there are still going to be enemies from around here. I mean, you're not, we're not going to promote this chapter. Ross might, though. Oh, and Loot needs to be healed desperately, so I might have to send her towards this side of the map. Alright, oh, I should probably show that village convers house conversation. Firstly, though, how fitting that the two Avengers are the only ones left to move here. And how fitting that I get to do this with Adhulma. Let's go. I was going to come up with some kind of cool line there, but I, I'm not going to be able to top the actual games writing that conversation. I just love that boss conversation so much. It was a bit of a lackluster level up, though. You might have noticed the legendary weapon Flash there, which has existed in a lot of games in the series, but uh, for this one, it's for the Sacred Twins. I think Fire Emblem... F f was it in 3? I know it was in 4. But I forget if it was also in 3 for the Regalia of Arcania. It might have been in 3, I don't know. But I know it was definitely in 4. How many uses of that do you have left? At the moment, its only use is just wasting time. Well, that was unlucky to hit, but did nothing anyway. Finally, you're moving, which is good, because that means that the skies are a lot clearer for Cormag. 